Welcome to Ideas Live. I'm Anne Marie Oman, and this is my co host, Darren Anderson. And we are breaking from our normal uh, range of topics this, this month to celebrate Poetry Month. April is Poetry Month, and so we are on it for poetry this month. And as part of our exploration of poetry, we decided to talk a little bit about poetry for non-poets. And what would that mean? You know, how did we come to poetry? And for people, you know, both of us write mm -hmm. poems and we kind of explore that whole literary element. But what does it mean? What does poetry mean to people who are not poets and not practicing that, but who love poetry? Or maybe the maybe better- Maybe they don't. Yeah, maybe yeah. they don't. That's the, that's the better mm -hmm. question is how might poetry uh, help them or mm -hmm. might it be of interest to them and how do we lead people to that if we if we want to mm -hmm. So all of those questions kind of generated this show and so we thought we'd open that up and see what happens And I'm curious where did your love of poetry start before you were even thought about being a writer? Oh, so when I was really little um, I had a grandfather who was a painter and an artist and he would read to me, and he would read to me often from a book, uh, oh. Hiawatha, the poem by That's Longfellow. Worth. Yeah, I'm and it Longfellow. is a beautiful book, and it has absolutely gorgeous illustrations, which I'm sure, because my grandpa was a painter, meant a lot to him. But I know this poem is awfully politically incorrect. Yeah, um, yeah, and and wrongheaded. But the illustrations were quite extraordinary. And all I knew as a five-year-old was that the language was beautiful and right. rhythmic, and that animals talked, and they had personalities, and, and nature was alive in a way that was really different from anything I had experienced, mm -hmm. and the music of the language. So that was my first. I know. think for so many of us, that was in fact the the beginning of a love of poetry and it's still I think associated with some of the what they call the immortal poems you yeah. know is that whole yeah. idea of what's rhyme and rhythm and how dominant that mm -hmm. was especially in the 18th and 19th century poems that that have remained somehow I, I remember um, this wasn't until high school but we were studying um, Alfred Lord Tennyson mm -hmm. and uh, Lady of Shalott and all of those yeah. beautifully mythical poems and most of the kids were turning their noses up at it but not all of us mm -hmm. many of us were like oh this sounds so beautiful you yeah. know and the drama of it and the gorgeous lush sound of it and of course we start with that sound with uh, nursery rhymes oh I know and yeah. some of it's funny I mean one of my favorite books that my daughter had, <laughs> a great big ugly man came up and tied his horse to me. It's out of print. You can get a copy on the internet for $100. I mean, it's a... Oh my gosh. Because the illustrations are extraordinary. But but the humor of it, you know, and limericks. Yeah. You know, oh, there yeah. There was an old man from Peru who dreamed right. he was eating his shoe. He woke in a fright in the middle of the night and found it was perfectly true. I mean, it <laughs> still makes me laugh. But the, and it's just silly. It's silly. But also, it occurred to me that discovering what a metaphor is, you know, mm -hmm. the notion that you can say something that means something else and there's richness added, mm -hmm. it's like value added, and some of it came out of the cliches that my father used, you know, like, let sleeping dogs lie, yeah. don't rock the boat, ooh, what does that mean? You know? yeah. I mean, in, yeah. the, in so many ways, the richness of language comes to us that forms poetry. Yeah, and I think for me also that whole idea of learning about metaphor, some of it came from biblical teaching. Yeah, I haven't thought of you that know, too. It's, mm -hmm. it's a, a lot of that. But the whole process of falling in love with poetry, I thought we might look at some poems mm -hmm. and look at some poems that 
either led us to poetry or that we think people who may not love poetry just might like. Mm -hmm. And as a guest, I thought we might need someone who was a renegade poet <laughs> and, and maybe um, just a little bit of a rogue. And so we have a guest coming on I'm really excited about and we're going to talk about how do we fall in love with poetry. Great. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Ideas Live. I'm Anne Marie Oman, and this is my co host, Taryn Anderson. And we are here for our April show, which is all about poetry for non poets. And our guest here today is Michael Delp. He is the former chair of Interlochen Arts Academy's creative writing department, long standing friend, and also co director of the Made in Michigan series at Wayne State University Press. And he is a long time writer of poetry and lover of poetry and advocate of poetry and he's also a little rogue. So we're welcoming <laughs> Mike you. Delp. Very, and very kind of you to ask me. I'm happy to be here. Well, we thought we'd start with just sharing some of the poems that if you were a non-poet might start to lead you in. But before that, maybe maybe let's start with what are your first memories of poetry? Yeah, how did uh, you? Fifth yeah. grade, I was in the fifth grade and it was uh, Ruby Wyckoff was the teacher. And we were reading, in the fifth grade I was reading books like Walden. Yeah. And she would often read these books to us. And I remember distinctly the first the first music I heard in a poem was uh, the Song of the Chattahoochee by Sidney Lanier, and it just, it just, it was just a beautiful rolling poem, and it just caught, it caught my attention. I don't know if that's actually where it started, mm -hmm. but you know, it, I'd like to think that it did yeah. back then. Yeah. yeah, but once again, what we were talking about earlier, it's the music it's of the, music. the language. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And all those rhymes you were talking about, nursery rhymes yeah. and uh, limericks and. It, it all kind of crowds in there, and you know, when you, when you get to be my age, they all, all those memories are in a big ball. So yeah. you got to pull out you know, a cord or a <laughs> string there to find out where it started. Which one? Which yeah, one? which yeah. one it is. Another yeah. thing I thought of too was songs and lyrics. Oh, I sure. I mean, haven't yeah. they just shaped your life? Mm -hmm. I mean, bridge over troubled waters or mm -hmm. things that you think, wow, that just expresses my in, soul. Oh, and so some actual beautiful poetry and songs that, that formed us as well. I remember learning songs like like um, Simon and Garfunkel's yeah. oh, lyrics sure. were full of poetry, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. of course Dylan. You're mm -hmm. a huge Dylan mm -hmm. fan, and that was the shaping of attitudes a mm -hmm. lot of times yeah. was in that. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think because we're so keyed into our own little precious little individuality that we we tend to make a soundtrack for our lives. Oh, yeah. And, and that sometimes that's a daily thing, you know, mm -hmm. like, and the music changes every day. And if you're, out, if you're listening to a song on the radio, suddenly it's just, you know, mm -hmm. your whole past opens mm -hmm. up again. Oh, sure, it's yeah. It's just very evocative. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes I just have to stop on the side of the road. <laughs> yes. Yeah, because yeah. I'm just dumbstruck by mm -hmm. yeah. what I did. The, and, <laughs> and, and, well, and, then there's that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and also just the overwhelming sense and the emotional or psychic sense mm -hmm. that comes back. Mm -hmm. Not nostalgic necessarily, but like, oh, this is what it means, you know. This mm -hmm. is, and maybe that's where I can get back to this idea of what poetry does. I think it helps meaning in some ways. It helps something mean. Mm -hmm. I don't it, it know. It expresses things for us that maybe we wouldn't otherwise yeah. be able to express. Gives us insights, meanings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about you? Well, I always go back to um, Jim Harrison saying that poetry is a language your soul would speak if you could teach your soul to speak. Yeah. And so it's, uh, it's soul, to me it's soul language and it's like Donald Hall says a poet is just the one person's insides talking to another person's insides. So um, the tr to me, the transmitter is always on. The, the, the poem, the transmitter of the poem is always on. It's the receiver. It's the listener or the reader that, that kind of needs to be woken up or they, they go to sleep consciously. Like <laughs> you say, I'm going to read you a poem. They go, Poop. no, you're not. Mm -hmm. So... That's a tough one. That's what yeah. we're. That's a little bit what we're talking about today. Yeah. And the idea of reading, of of hearing it first, I think, is so mm -hmm. important mm -hmm. because often on the page it doesn't speak right. to you. Yeah. 
But if someone is reading it to you, that's why Hiawatha meant a lot to me, because my grandpa was sitting there reading it. Mm -hmm. so and the was implication was, connection. this is important. When, if you read it again, do you hear him? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And it was, and, and just mentioning again that, you know, it's not a politically correct or popular book now, but it almost doesn't matter how you come to poetry or how you come to literature at all. I mean, Nancy Drew probably wasn't great literature either, but if it created in me a love of reading, mm -hmm. then you move from there. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think we can come from many, many doorways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I often uh, uh, think of a poem um, as a script for your head so that you willingly give your imagination away to somebody and then they they put this in your head and you get to, you get to see what they see. Mm -hmm. They don't mm -hmm. see any better than you do necessarily, but they see differently. And so that opens up a whole mm -hmm. field of your imagination that wasn't there before, I think. And I, I think that's so true, but I'm curious about how does that um, m make us, uh, why is poetry different from prose in that way? It's, I mean, when we come to this language that's almost, well, for us, almost like a sacred text. Mm -hmm. And how, why is that so different from prose, from just the lines? Part of it is the compression, don't mm -hmm. you think? And yeah. the, the synthesis and the absolute focus that um, adds power kind of mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know, also that sense of soul talking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really? I think it is the compaction of it and the, the intensity of it. Uh, five lines of poetry versus mm -hmm. two paragraphs. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that you can't do the same thing in, in fiction, mm -hmm. but it's so, it's so immediate and it's, and it's instantly there. It might take you a while in a piece of prose to come to the same realizations with the imagery. Can but, you think of lines? I mean, I, there were lines that I, when I was in college, I remember reading Wordsworth and the line, nature never did betray the heart that loved her. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I never forgot that. I thought, yeah. This is really Beautiful. true. Yeah. This is me, you know. Yeah. And, and then there's another line from Swinburne that has helped me my whole life. Even the weariest river winds somewhere safe to see. Mm. That's it's, beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah. And I want to believe it's true. It's comforting. And stuff like that. I mean, it wants, it's in there. And, yeah. it, and it's valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I it's think, nurturing. And I think I think that's that's true. It's the it's the compaction, but it's also the line that that becomes a sort of sacred motto or mm -hmm. credo almost. Not mm -hmm. that but that's that's how well, it like operates. The line on your arm. Yeah, it's something the line on really my believe. arm. Yeah. yeah, I haven't seen that yet. So after the show, I want to take a really close well, just look. Just so at our the, audience we'll knows it. what we're talking it about, up. it's tell me what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life, and it's a Mary Oliver mm -hmm. line, and uh, it is a line that I wanted to. Um, assume as a way of keeping myself awake, mm -hmm. you know, keeping mm -hmm. myself. And speaking of, you have a poem. Let's let's read a okay. few poems Well, here. the strange thing is, is sitting here in, in yeah. Marie's pile this is a poem <laughs> that I had also brought with me. It's a poem called Summons by Robert Francis, and I, I generally mm. know it by heart. And I've recited it at, at weddings, and including my own. Let me see if I can do it. I just um, want to say to our to our, our viewing audience that this is one of my favorite things, to have a poem read to me. Mm -hmm. It's just so making me happy. All right, let me see if I can do it. Keep me from going to sleep too soon, or if I go to sleep too soon, come wake me up. Come any hour of night, come whistling up the road, stomp on the porch, bang on the door, make me get out of bed and come and light a light. Tell me the northern lights mm. are on and show me. Tell me the clouds are doing something to the moon they never did before. Mm and make me see. Talk to me till I'm half as wide awake as you and start to dress wondering why I ever went to bed at all. <laughs> tell me the walking is superb. Not only tell me, but persuade me. You know I'm not too hard persuaded. <laughs> Great poem. Isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. But you know what I, I, I love about that whole idea is keep me from going to sleep too soon. Yes. It's, uh, maybe that's the essence of it. It's this love of poetry is all about waking up. Mm -hmm. Yes, I you believe know? it. And, and Life yeah. is about waking up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that line, uh, 
tell me the clouds are doing mm -hmm. something, something to, to that, the that they've moon. not done before. before. Yeah, which is of course. Yeah, I true. think it is about waking up. Um, is Bo, Bo, J, Jacob Boehm says that we are all asleep in the outward man. That you know, one of the things that poetry does for us is it it, it wakes us up, and then we're we're mindful that we need to pay attention. Mm -hmm. So, because uh, we don't pay very close attention anymore. We just when you said animals yeah. used to speak, they they still do. <laughs> they still speak. There you go. But we we we're don't we don't hear them because we're not listening to them, and we've lost the use of that language somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't, I don't know if it's because of science or technology or busyness. We're just mm. too busy to, to listen all the time. Can yeah. you read a poem of yours yeah, or um, of someone's that yeah, has uh, meant a lot to you? Before we start, I want to read, because Mar uh, I know Anne-Marie loves Mary Oliver, and I'm sure <laughs> Karen too. does too. Mm -hmm. This is from Anne-Marie's A Poetry Handbook, and I, I usually don't, I don't uh, traffic much in poetry handbooks, but this is a beautiful, beautiful book. I know this one. Um, she, she says of poetry, poetry is a life cherishing force and it requires a vision of faith to use an old fashioned term. Yes, indeed. For poems are not words after all, but fires for the cold, ropes let down to the lost, something as necessary as bread in the pockets of the hungry. Yes, indeed. So that's yeah. kind of where I start with Ropes with somebody. Down to the lost. Isn't that beautiful? And bread, bread in the pockets of the mm -hmm. hungry. Yeah. So I, that's where I usually start when I'm when I'm talking to uh, any audience that seems a little reticent. Mm -hmm. And I also have to understand. You have. I think you have to meet them where they are. Yes. And lots of times you have to go in and you have to undo, literally undo what's happened somewhere in their lives to turn off that receiver. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Because they've, they've probably run into somewhere where they were kind of bludgeoned with a poem, mm -hmm. or they were made to think that the only interpretation of the poem was the teacher's yes. that was correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, that's yeah, really, yeah. I think. And that's, that, that's something that takes a while to overcome. Um, and I'm thinking about when William Stafford, he did, this isn't exactly what he said, but he said, a poem knows where you are, it finds you and puts its thumb on you. I love, <laughs> love that idea. Yeah. But uh, again, that's, that's the transmitter. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, the, that's what's doing uh, the work. So I brought, uh, I want to start with this. Uh, this poem is originally titled This Life, but it's always published under with Kit, age seven, at the beach. So it's... It's about Stafford being at the beach with his son, which we can probably, up here, we can all relate to, right? Mm -hmm. With Kit, age seven, at the beach, we would climb the highest dune from there to gaze and come down. The ocean was performing. We contributed our climb. Waves leapfrogged and came straight out of the storm. What should our gaze mean? Kit waited for me to decide. Standing on such a hill, what would you tell your child? That was an absolute vista. Those waves raced far and cold. How far could you swim, Daddy, in such a storm? As far as was needed, I said. And as I talked, I swam. Oh, mm. yeah. And it's so mm. simple. It's just mm. such a simple mm. little moment. And then the, the person that hears it, Gets to, gets to decide what it means to them, mm -hmm. which I, I really love about that. Rather mm -hmm. than being told, well, it's, it's about this, this, this. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a beautiful poem, and, and Stafford's I, amazing. And I love the way that last line, and as I talked, I swam, mm -hmm. be, it suddenly takes on, you know, the poem opens mm -hmm. that. Well, know. yeah, and it opens when the boy asks that question. Mm -hmm. yeah. All of a sudden you go, whoa, this is about something bigger. Yeah. 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 And the whole then then it becomes metaphorical mm -hmm. in that way. The storm is bigger and the the lake is bigger and the swim is bigger than what it was. That's that's, you know, William Stafford means so much to me because of him one of my my first early efforts at poetry <laughs> won a, the Abbey Copps Prize. Mm -hmm. He was the mm -hmm. judge for that and it was my wow. very early on in, way back in the 80s and and he mm -hmm. he when you um, were like two 
Thank you. But he, um, and it was, it was a poem I sent in thinking, no, no one will love this. It was called Folding Sheets. And he, he chose that one. I remember it, that was a defining moment for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was really powerful. What is the line? Does anybody remember about, um, uh, it's something to the effect that poetry has something that cont is contained that men die for every day. Oh. You know, uh, yeah. I but have what no is idea. contained well, there? William, Carlos Williams. Yeah, I think. The truth can be found. In poet, oh, truth can be. Found. I'm sorry, but yeah. it's something to the effect that what is found there, men die for every mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. Not that they are literally dying, but mm -hmm. that we are. We need poetry right, but we're in a way. That sort yeah, of yeah. I think it's possible that a poem can save your life on mm -hmm. any given day, when when it comes, and you're there. If those two things meet, it can save your life. Mm -hmm. So that's why you have to be awake. <laughs> Because yeah. they're coming all the time. If yeah. you if you sit down and read, they're coming. You know, one's not going to run into you on Front Street. Yeah. But you need to be ready. Yeah. So let's have another poem. Let's pick another one. Got? I have got. Um, this is a Nick Bozanic poem. Nick was mm. um, also a chair of the creative writing department at Interlochen Arts Academy many years ago, and he has a couple of books. But this is called What We Learn of Love. And I just think this, this begins to get at that, that opening of the imagination. So what we learn of love is to fear the heart, its power and its appetites, its gravity, which is greater than the moons that stirs the blood in women and turns the seas, which is greater than the suns that tugs the earth so gently toward incandescence. Though these are great and solemn motions of the urge that weds all things to all others. The hearts more urgent here where living must be tried. And though we have these wings we call desires, we are not ragged moths that flutter into fires. We each <laughs> are Icarus, fledged with longing for a light which, being weightless, will or cannot have us. So we fall, we fall, we fall, and always we fall into the unfathomable well of the world. Mm. So, you know, Beautiful. that's a poem, I love that because the first stanza could stand by itself. You know, the mm -hmm. heart's more urgent here where living must be tried, but then he pushes it further into this whole idea of, you know, all of that is, um, permeated with desire, with mm -hmm. longing, and that's part of being human, mm -hmm. and that's why we fail, and we fall, and we, mm -hmm. and you know, the fall is all kinds of ways. You know, going back to hearing somebody read you a poem, I've heard Nick read so many poems mm -hmm. over in my lifetime that I can hear his voice mm -hmm. when, when, when mm -hmm. I hear that poem, yeah. and when Nick re read a poem or reads a poem, you can hear almost every letter in yes. the word. Mm -hmm. He's very he, it's it's not uh, pedestrian, mm -hmm. but he's very careful, and mm -hmm. and um, it's like it's like Gary Snyder talking about rip rap, the way the words are laid, they're laid mm -hmm. down on the mm -hmm. page. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, It's really nice to hear that. I think yeah. that's when I was growing up, a hundred years ago, we were required to memorize poems mm -hmm. and recite them in class. We had a little booklet of memory selections. Mm -hmm. I mean, not great poetry always. But still, the exercise of having to commit it to memory mm -hmm. was valuable, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, I made my granddaughters do that when I taught them poetry. Mm -hmm. We had to memorize something and recite it. There's a really terrific program in the schools now. It's Poetry Out Loud, mm -hmm. where students are mm -hmm. yeah. still memorizing. You know, that's part of an assignment. I think they have to memorize two poems from yeah. a list. And the kids who give themselves over to that are really they, they're alive to poetry. They and, become alive to poetry. And if somebody's reciting a poem to you, don't you listen more carefully than if they're reading it to mm. you? Yes, I yeah. think that's true. I, heard, I, I can't remember the poet, but I once heard James Wright do an hour from memory of a poet that he loved. I wish I could recall the poet, but that proves it. I can't remember anything. <laughs> like, I can't remember, I couldn't recite one of my poems for a million dollars, I just mm -hmm. couldn't do it. I can, I know snippets, sure. but. 
Can I read one of your favorite, my favorite poems sure. of yours? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm, this I'm, is Mike's, uh, one of your early books, that's Over the, first the one. Graves of Horses, which I read avidly when I was cutting my teeth on poetry. Um, and it's called First Snow, and it's just one that I have always loved. I turn on the yard light and watch the grass disappear. And two white chairs on the beach grow larger, their arms filling with snow until they almost touch. 5 a.m. and I try to imagine my daughter's dream, trapped mm. under the snow and waking not to a quilt over her face but a thick crust of snow, how she asks her father to slide over the surface face down, sure he will know the scent of her breath rising through a vent in the snow, and how he might look out his window in the morning, see the small curve of her body outlined by new snow, her breasts deep, her breasts asleep and dreaming inside her chest. And I just, I mm, just so love the father-daughter relationship mm -hmm. in that, and the sense mm. I think for fathers of their growing their their sense of protection, mm -hmm. and maybe because oh, I yeah. know Jamie too, <laughs> yeah. you know. Yeah, that's huge. Um, yeah. But growing that sense of protection and and the 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 world, the snow, not only as this beautiful. Thing that encases us all in the first privacy of mm -hmm. snow, but also is that threat that you yeah have. I'd for completely forgotten that I wrote that really yeah and that's I haven't read that poem in years and years it's not that I don't think about it but I haven't thought about that poem and or read that poem and I have ages. given this poem to most of the young fathers who really? have daughters oh, that I that's know. That's really sweet. I, I've that's copied awesome. it out somewhere oh, and I say, here's, really nice. here's for you. the new yeah. dad, mm -hmm. especially if they have a daughter, you know, mm -hmm. because yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a serious uh, relationship. Yeah. Very serious. Yeah. Probably the most serious one of your life. Yeah. yeah. You got another poem? Yeah. I do. Uh, I, love, I love Ray Carver. Uh, I love his fiction, but I love his poetry even more. And uh, Ray Carver gets more mileage out of a simple observation or a simple act than anyone I know. This is, a, this is my, one of my favorite Ray Carver poems. It's called Shiftless, S-H-I-F-T-L-E-S-S. -S. The people who were better than us were comfortable. They lived in painted houses with flush toilets, drove cars whose year and make were recognizable. The ones worse off were sorry and didn't work. Their strange cars sat on blocks in dusty yards. The years go by and everything and everyone gets replaced. But this much is still true. I never liked work. My goal was always to be shiftless. I saw the merit in that. I like the idea of sitting in a chair in front of your house for hours, doing nothing but wearing a hat and drinking cola. What's wrong with that? drawing on a cigarette from time to time, spitting, making things out of wood with a knife. Where's the harm there? Now and then calling the dogs to hunt rabbits. Try it sometime. Once in a while hailing a fat blonde kid like me and saying, don't I know you? Not, what are you going to be when you grow up? <laughs> Isn't that a great he poem? is so accessible, it's like, you're in the experience. The words vanish, and you're there. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I he, mean, that quality that he has to do that is hmm? absolutely remarkable. And when you read his, you know, those really sh short, tight, little minimal stories mm -hmm. that he writes, mm -hmm. well, they're just but that, gorgeous. But that whole, I think, what appeals to the non-poet for that is the question of, "Don't I know you?" Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that, that's, that, the, yes, yeah. that's the that's the connective tissue right there mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. what what is it that draws us to poetry? Mm -hmm. Well, I know you, yeah. and I that. recognize I recognize things in that poem yeah. that uh, that I see mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. Isn't it interesting because being shiftless was not a compliment? Well, if no, mother, I, if no, mother no, that's no, another no. appeal. It yeah. really celebrates and so there's something. That, that sort of rebellion and defiance in mm -hmm. that. Yeah, know? I imagine when you were graduating from high school and your parents saying, what are you going to do? And you say, oh, I think I'm going to be shiftless. I'll just sit in the yard, <laughs> wear a hat. Yeah. Which is the same as <laughs> saying, well, I think I want to be a writer. Yeah, <laughs> just know? about. Like, just are you going to make money doing that? Right. That's oh. always the question. But, you know, 
I know people now who live, you know, they're, they're working in mechanics or mm -hmm. uh, very, very practical careers, which are probably way more lucrative mm -hmm. than teaching. Mm -hmm. and, and poetry is part of their lives. Mm -hmm. yeah. They look to poetry. They will, they, they find poems. They, you know. People, are, more people are susceptible to poetry than we imagine. And I had the experience of when we renovated my kitchen a few years ago and we found that, that old leather boot in the ceiling and I, mm. and my carpenter, a good friend, he found it and I ended up writing a poem about it and a friend took a photo of it and we had it framed and, and Bruce got so taken by the idea that you could write a poem about a boot, a boot from the yeah. ceiling mm -hmm. that he started taking pictures of windmills out in Benzie where he lives and wrote a poem and brought it to me. Mm -hmm. oh. And I and that, that See, dialogue really has continued. Compliment. And it's kind of like he it occurred to him that he could do this. He mm -hmm. could first of all appreciate mm -hmm. it and then do it? I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think, isn't that great? And I yeah. think that's that could be so much more common if we could figure out ways to do it. You know, I think the for me, the lesson there is that um, it's, a, it's a, to me, it's, it's as much about seeing mm -hmm. as it is about actually sitting down to write the poem. Mm -hmm. When Harrison yes. says, in order to create a poem, you must first uh, uh, invent a pen that will write what you want to say. And mm -hmm. so to me, the pen is not a physical, uh, real yes. pen. Yeah. It's about how you learn how to see. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I'm more interested now in seeing than yes. I am in actually writing anything. Yeah. 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 I, I get that. Yeah. Do you have one? Can I read a poem of mine? Of course. Yes. Um, this was in a dunes. This is a poem that um, people have always responded to when I've read it aloud. Um, if I can find it here. The title itself always gets sort of a chuckle. Speaking of first husbands. Hmm. Speaking of first husbands, she said, and we all laughed, even those who were married to their first husbands. <laughs> Sounds like the title of something, I said. You were bumming a cigarette in the hall at junior college, Russian name, broken nose, tight muscled half back, I wasn't big, but I was fast. Austin Healy rumbled like your voice. Me, 17. You, almost 21. Suddenly I knew why my mother said, don't. Hmm. Car you couldn't afford blew a rod. I can always get money. Married 10 years later. You didn't read books, never finished college. Red flags I tried to bleach. Smell of Clorox on my hands. You in the garage with an X-Acto knife building a better shipping carton. World beat a goddamn path, Richard. You taught me to make a Jack Daniels perfect Manhattan on the rocks with a twist. Mm. To say corrugated instead of cardboard. To almost <laughs> stop worrying about money. A sturdy box is still a box. I married you because I felt safe. Then I left because I felt safe. Or some reason. Must have been reasons. Walked out of the courthouse together, went for coffee. I poured my cold into your cup to make room for hot. Perfectly compatible, the waiter said. In some ways, you said. Mm. Wow. Wow. Whew. What a terrific image. Whew. You know, Born and coffee. because all of us know how vulnerable relationships can be, I think mm -hmm. that one just nails it, you know, about how we don't, all, we just don't know what, our lives are going to give us and mm -hmm. how, who we're going to be happy with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that, but that whole idea that you relate to a poem because it's something universal, even for women or people mm -hmm. who are married to their first, mm -hmm. right. their, who are, remain right. married. Who, remain who are married. still married yeah. to their first husband. And probably yeah. shouldn't be. <laughs> <laughs> there are those. There's days. that yeah. secret thought. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Can what I read I, another yeah, Ray Carver poem? Oh, please. This poem is about fishing. Uh, and it has a couple terms in it that people might not know. But if I'm, if, if I'm just doing a, a general introduction to somebody about poetry, and I see somebody in the uh, several people or one person who looks like uh, he's been dragged there, uh, I might read this poem. Good. Mm. It's called Bobber, like a fishing bobber. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On, the, on the Columbia River near Vantage, Washington, we fish for whitefish in the winter months. My dad, Swede, Mr. Lindgren, and me. They used belly reels, pencil-length sinkers, 
red, yellow, or brown flies baited with maggots. They wanted distance and went clear out there to the edge of the riffle. I fished near shore with a quill bobber and a cane pole. My dad kept his maggots alive and warm under his lower lip. <laughs> oh, Mr. Lindgren didn't drink. I liked him better than my dad for a time. He let me steer his car, teased me about my name, Junior, and said one day I'd grow into a fine man, remember all this, and fish with my own son. But my dad was right. I mean, he kept silent and looked into the river, worked his tongue like a thought behind the bait. Nice. And you can see, Ooh. you can, Ooh. I mean, I've never had a maggot in my lower lip. But, but, you I can, can, but I that can, image, yeah, uh, it's never disgusting. forget that image. Yeah, it's disgusting. I've seen Bear Grylls eat them yeah. on, on Man versus Wild. But, but there are certain people who will read that poem, and that poem will change their lives. Yeah, and they'll say, you know? "Wow, I didn't know. I didn't. You're right. I didn't know that you could have a poem about." Fishing, fishing with maggots in it. Right. It's really right. not about fishing. It's about something else. It's not about maggots. It's either. about no. in friendship exactly. among no, men. Whole, right. But, yes. Yeah. And that wonderful little almost parenthetical observation about the man he liked better than his dad. Yeah, because for a he while. didn't drink. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, there's a lot going on there between the between the fishing. Yeah, and, and you know, Carver just grew up dirt grew up dirt poor in Yakima, yeah. and mm -hmm. a lot of his poems are. Just gut wrenching about being being in a tiny little house where there's a lot going on and it's not none of not it's good. good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. But what I what I notice about that is that you know in the poems that we have been sharing, we've been sharing free verse, which mm -hmm. is very different from where we started with Hiawatha and the and, and, and the rhythm of mm -hmm. the rhythm and rhyme of mm -hmm. of eighteenth yes, and nineteenth and early twentieth century poetry, particularly. But what the free verse gives us is this home home spun narrative that allows so many more people that invites so mm -hmm. many more people in mm -hmm. and and also the lushness of those imagery that imagery and the lushness of the language about the the, the fishing gear mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know the the pencil thin I don't remember what that was mm -hmm. but you know you can just see the lure even mm -hmm. if you can't even if you don't know mm -hmm. exactly what it is you know that's something of the lush language of poetry. And it's about, it's about, really, to me, it's about, just writing is about knowing things. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, lots of young writers tend to use a lot of adjectives. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll, just, they'll, yeah. oh, they'll yeah. put some Way down and they'll throw a bunch of adjectives in there. But to me, it's really about the nouns. The mm -hmm. nouns do, I mean, the adjectives are the, they do some work. But the nouns, you know, like when, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about my new grandson. Oh. He can't talk. And he's looking at all the time, and I and so I point things out to him, and he has no idea what he's looking at. I'll say, "Oh, there's a duck." He doesn't know that's a duck from a mm -hmm. stick, but pretty soon he starts to get this language. See, and mm -hmm. I, but I'm thinking, what is he, what does he think a duck is? Because mm -hmm. he doesn't know what a duck is, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but he does. But he's curious. Deep inside, he knows it's a mm -hmm. thing because mm -hmm. it moves, right? Yeah, yeah. So Go. What do you got? Well, oh, this is a. Great, I showed this when I came in. <laughs> this is uh, this is a great anthology, low down and coming on, a feast of delicious and dangerous poems about pigs. This is a beautiful this little is what, book. This is how we fall in yeah, love with poetry. Yeah, this yeah. Is, and this is just a short little poem. It's called Pig Tents. At night around the campfires, just beyond the shadow of the knife, they Ooh. tell disconsolate stories about their fierce history as mountain savages, fleet fugitives from conquest before they were driven to the flatlands and the mud and the taunts of magpies and men. Oh. That's a great little book. Mm. Yeah. But that gets at the human fantasy, mm -hmm. you know, that, that it's about pigs, but the human fantasy of what we, what, the stories we tell in the tents when mm -hmm. we're almost and nomads fires. again. You guys yeah. talk about fires. Yeah, yeah. the bonfires. Do we need to think about wrapping up? I'm well, I don't, clock. I'm not ready. I'm not ready to do that. <laughs> I just well. want to mention a couple of books um, that I have been reading recently. Deaf Republic by Ilya Kaminsky is um, a parable for our times. Uh, Ilya is, in fact, deaf. 
And mm. in it, um, an atrocity has been done in a village and the village, the entire village becomes deaf. Mm -hmm. And so it's a really interesting, interesting poem and the poems also stand alone. Mm. Uh, another favorite poet of mine, mm. Dorian mm -hmm. Lux, mm -hmm. only mm -hmm. as the day is long is um, new and selected. So this goes back and gives a selection of mm -hmm. our early stuff and then later stuff that we have just always um, enjoyed. And also another great one, two great poets who have mm -hmm. passed recently who write for everyone. Mm -hmm. Everyone mm -hmm. can identify with this. Um, W.S. Merwin and Mary Oliver, both of them um, have made their place for people mm -hmm. who are not poets mm -hmm. and you fall in love with their work. Mm -hmm. So. And it, did you have any you want to suggest? Uh, yeah, get this book. <laughs> get, yeah, this, <laughs> get this book about pigs. <clears throat> this is so good. I This uh, James... Uh, Lenfesti? Lenfesti. Lenfesti. I think that's... He's uh, he's local, I think. Oh, really? Uh, in the oh, summer. Cool. Uh, Traverse Magazine, a few years ago, when I was talking to Jeff Smith, he and Jeff are pretty good friends, they did a they did a really nice story on him. Okay. So it's a nice anthology. I'm going to end with um, oh, good. just uh, the briefest of poems uh, by Rumi, who is the Persian poet whose poetry began to be resurrected by mm -hmm. Coleman Barks back mm -hmm. in the 80s. And it's just very simple. Let yourself be silently drawn by the stronger pull of what you really love. No more advice. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. So Perfect. classically Perfect. moving. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you Michael. Thank you. What a what great time. Really fun. Really Thank you for having this. me. This we'll really be right nice. back you. for Thanks. closing up. Welcome back to the conclusion of Ideas Live. Today we have been talking about our love of poetry, and we've been trying to offer up some ideas and thoughts for non-poets to help get a jump start on just the love of and reading of poetry. And Karen, we had Mike Delp here who was oh. just, he picked those poems that I guess I wouldn't have thought of, even though I admire Ray Carver a great deal, mm -hmm. but those poems that are so solid. Yeah, they're very precise, very detailed. Very, um, re I don't, I don't like the term relatable, but they they depict ordinary experiences, and we can connect with some portion of them. Yes, and I, and I think that's one of the things that I'd like to you know to say to non poets that you know this is another kind of sacred text that can comfort and mm -hmm. bring you guidance enlighten. and enlighten and, and open as, your imagination. As Michael said, save your life. Yeah, save your <laughs> life. Yeah. And um, at the end of our conversation, we were starting to turn back toward those original ideas about sound and rhyme and rhythm. And you brought this very beautiful old book. Well, when I was in college, I learned of The Shropshire Lad by A.E. A. Hausman, that he had written this series of poems. And so I bought this little copy um, and decided that I would read one poem between each of uh, my hours of studying for exams that I would oh. I would offer them to myself as a reward after a certain amount of studying. And the very first time I opened the book, I read the whole thing. <laughs> so it didn't work very well as a study reward, but it absolutely electrified me. And so I'm gonna, this is a couple of stanzas that I remembered forever being a romantic. If truth in hearts that perish could move the powers on high, I think the love I bear you should make you not to die. Sure, sure, if steadfast meaning, if single thought could save, the world might end tomorrow, you should not see the grave. Oh my gosh, isn't that, isn't that the nature of poetry is right there. Yes, it is. You know, it lasts mm -hmm. beyond us. It does. Yeah. So thanks for this conversation. Thank you, Karen. This and thank great. you for staying with us on this really, really special month. Go out, buy a collection of poems or, or read a poem to your sibling or your spouse or your child and celebrate the comfort of that language. Mm -hmm.